today on Let the Bible Speak. Are you part of a strong church? And how do you measure the strength of a congregation? We'll talk about that next. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with Kevin Presley. Welcome to Let the Bible Speak. It's great to be with you today. Are you a member of a local church? And if so, do you think it's a strong church? Is it a congregation that measures up to the strength, fidelity, and vitality of the church as we read about it in the New Testament? Well, that begs the question, how do we measure a strong church anyhow? What criteria do we use? Well, I don't think you can do any better than to measure a church like the inspired Apostle Paul did. Paul's desire was the same as Christ's, and that is to see the church be grounded in truth, be growing, working, and to be strong. For example, he said in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in the 11th verse, that Christ gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love." So reads a portion of Ephesians 4 in the King James Version. Members of the early church were endowed with spiritual gifts that brought the church as a whole to maturity. And whether in the age of supernatural gifts, the first century, or today when the effects or the products of those gifts are realized and enjoyed through the Word that those gifts produced and left for us, the church is to function in such a way that it becomes strong and mature. Are you part of a church like that? How did Paul measure a strong church? Well, there are five ways in which Paul referred to the church that point to what constitutes a strong congregation, and we'll look at each of them in a moment. The psalmist said, Through thy precepts I get understanding. The Bible is the revelation of God to man. And you simply can't live for God until you know something about the Word of God. And you may say, Well, I want to read and study the Bible, but I don't know where to begin. I feel overwhelmed or I don't understand the Bible. I want to offer you a wonderful way to get acquainted with the Scriptures. You'll learn about some of the most basic and foundational teachings of God's Word and you'll get a better handle on how to read and approach and study the Bible as a whole. Won't you get in touch with us today and ask to be enrolled in the Bible Correspondence Course. It won't cost you a penny, and we'll mail the lessons to your home, and you take your time to read and study through the lessons. I think you'll be surprised how much you'll learn. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. The Church of Christ is not a building, but rather a congregation of people. Universally, the word refers to all of the saved in Christ, 
but in a visible, organized, and functioning sense. The church is a local congregation of baptized believers who worship God together, work together in the spread of the gospel, and in the edification one of another. It is God's will that every Christian be part of such a local congregation. In fact, you cannot serve Christ without being part of His body. The Bible says in Ephesians 1 and verse 23 that the church is the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. That is, the church is the receptacle through which we enjoy and exercise the blessings that are found in Christ Jesus. Now, by being a member of the local church, I assemble with others to worship the Lord, as did congregations in the first century, according to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, Acts 20, and verse 7. Uh, I'm taught and edified within the local church, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 12. It is there that I receive encouragement and exhortation to be faithful to Christ and live the Christian life, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. And it's not that I'm just merely a part of the local church for what I receive, also what I give. It's there that I contribute my own abilities, talents, and opportunities the Lord has given me to serve, to build up others, and we all possess those unique abilities. Uh, it is within the local church that I receive sometimes the corrective discipline that I need when I sin or would stray from Christ, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Well, with all of that said, we of course want the church we are a member of to be strong and healthy. We certainly want it to be approved of God. We want it to be a strong and healthy church. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. In fact, sometimes, a church has the reputation of being strong when God doesn't see it that way at all. Jesus said to the church at Sardis in Asia Minor in Revelation 3 and verse 1, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. He said in verse 17 of the church in Laodicea, the lukewarm church, he said, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. They were oblivious to how they appeared in the eyes of God. What they saw and what God saw were two entirely different pictures. Could that be the case with the church you're a part of? Does it have a name that it's alive and vital, but in the sight of God it is dead and profitless? How would we know? Well, you see, some measure a church by some pretty worldly standards, and that's part of the problem. Uh, for example, don't, don't let a building deceive you. Churches today are spending millions and millions of dollars, unwarranted in my estimation, on campuses and complexes and cathedrals, and people are attracted to all of that. Uh, they think if they can afford a multi-million dollar complex, why, there's a church on the go, a church on the move. There's a church that, uh, that God is working among and uh, through that church, and they must be doing something right. But friends, churches of the first century often met in homes and private dwellings or in temporary spaces. There's certainly no emphasis placed in the New Testament upon the location where a church happened to meet. So don't be fooled by a building. Uh, some say crowds are a good gauge of a strong church. And that's not true either. God's faithful people, whether in the Old or New Testaments, have always been the minority. I, I can't think of an exception to that. Some will point to all of the various programs and committees, departments, and attractions that modern churches seem to boast of, such as never mentioned of the church we read about in the New Testament, much, much less used as a measure of its strength. No, rather, the Bible places a completely different emphasis upon a strong church. And what makes a strong church are not its physical properties, but its spiritual properties. Now, the Apostle Paul often commended churches for their strength and faithfulness. And I wonder what made them so in his estimation. I think it's a better measure of what the church is supposed to be when we think of the term, of the church rather, in the terms that the Apostle Paul used to describe it. Paul in particular used at least five metaphors to describe the church of Christ, such as a body. Uh, he called it a family, a temple. He said it's the kingdom. And he also referred to it as a bride. You know, when you think about it, each of these descriptions are very practical and they highlight a feature of the church, a unique feature of the church that makes it what God expects it to be in this world. Now, first of all, a strong church 
according to Paul's measure, is one that functions like a body. It is the body of Christ. In fact, Paul on several occasions referred to the church as a body. It was one of Paul's favorite metaphors for the church, particularly in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And that shows us that the church is more than an organization. It's an organism. Now you can have an organization, but not necessarily have life. You see, a functioning body lives and breathes and moves and feels and acts. It's not just an organization of independent parts, but rather those parts have inter inter uh, interdependent function as they are directed by its head, and that causes that body to not only live, but that body to function. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 27 says, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And back in verses 14 through 19, Paul shows how all of the various parts of a body, such as hands and feet and eyes and ears and nose and mouth, all work in cooperative concert to allow a body to live and function. And the church is to be that way. Now, every member of the church is a vital part of that body. Not everybody's a preacher. Not, not everyone is even a public teacher. In fact, some are forbidden in the Scriptures being public teachers. That doesn't make them any less important to the kingdom of God. Not everyone is suited to be a leader in the worship. Not everyone is suited to effectively do certain kinds of work that need to be done in the church. But every single member supplies a necessary and vital part. So first of all, a strong church is one that has an involved and working membership. Not a paid staff to work while everybody else turns out on Sunday to observe and go home. Every Christian is a participant in the work of the church. Every Christian is to participate in public worship. It's not a form of spiritual entertainment, even though some churches seem to be making it that. We don't come together to hear people perform. That's not the New Testament design. We come together to participate together in the worship. We come together to sing together, to study together, to pray together. Today, we've seen the rapid proliferation of the mega church movement churches with hundreds and sometimes thousands of members. And those are often thought of, are they not, as the strongest churches? But it's hard to imagine that a church that size, and in a church that size, every member finds a vital place of, of service. It's not just that you have a body of working members. It's not, not just that you have an innumerable number of members that are all just busy working. It's that you have a body of members that work together. If you have a body of members that are simply moving and operating, uh, speaking of a physical body, why well, you might have chaos and even something that's a danger to itself and to others. But if a body works together under the oversight of its head in coordination, then you have a wonderful thing. And then, you know, there are those who claim membership in a local church, but they don't go to worship every Lord's Day. They're really not involved in the work and outreach of the church. They don't even have a place in the church. The church is so large, and uh, uh, they're not even recognized hardly as members of that church. Nobody really knows who they are. Is that the Bible picture of a strong and a healthy relationship of believers? Do you occupy a scriptural, vital, effectual role in the local church? Do you supply something by being there? Now, let me ask you this. Does the church miss you when you're gone? What about when you're sick and you're not able to attend? What about when you are away worshiping in another congregation? Does that church of which you're a member, does it feel your absence? Does it miss your presence? Just like your body would miss a hand, a foot, an eye, an ear. You know, a strong church is not necessarily a large church. It's one that functions like a body. Second of all, a strong church loves like a family, according to Paul's measure. The church in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 is called the household or the family of God. And that speaks not only of blood relationship, but it speaks of love, concern, and care for one another. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9, Paul commended the church at Thessalonica, saying, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And then listen to him as he writes to that same church again in his next letter in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3. 
He said, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity or love of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Paul commended the church at Thessalonica, obviously, uh, a strong church for not only their strong faith, but their boundless love for one another. Jesus, of course, said that by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another, John 13 and verse 35. This isn't the same kind and intensity of love that we're to have for all men. It's not the kind of love that we may speak of in a general sense. Rather, this speaks of a, of a very uh, uh, wonderful, working, effectual, and intimate love amongst that body of believers to whom Paul wrote in uh, his letters to Thessalonica. But again, you know, often the churches that are touted as the strongest, the biggest, the most effectual, they're often the ones that are so large. I have friends who attend churches with, again, hundreds, in some cases, thousands of members. And it's almost amusing when I ask them of somebody else that I know who attends that congregation, and I'll say, oh, do you know so-and-so? You know so and so? And they'll say, well, no, I, I can't say I know who that is. And in some cases, they've attended services together for years. But they're so large, they don't even know one another. They haven't even met one another. Friend, a strong church is made up of people who not only know one another, but are involved in each other's lives and struggles and spiritual battles, one another's temporal and physical needs. Sometimes the argument is made about the, uh, the, the worship of the church. People will argue against the Bible pattern for a communion, for example, where Jesus communed with His disciples with a loaf of unleavened bread, a cup of fruit of the vine, and they say, well, we can't do, that way, do it that way even from a practical standpoint because how do you expect a large church to worship, to commune with one loaf and one cup? Friend, the size of the church doesn't determine the pattern. The pattern determines the size of the church. In other words, uh, uh, have you ever stopped to think about a church could become too large? A church can become too large to function like God desires for it to, to have the closeness and the intimacy and the oversight and the involvement in one another's spiritual lives that the church is intended to have. Friend, a church that is strong is a church that loves like a close family. Number three, a strong church worships like a temple. Worships like a temple. Paul called the church God's temple in this dispensation of time in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 12 when he said, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? The apostle Peter also said that we are not only the temple of God, but that all Christians are priests who offer spiritual sacrifices and offer up worship within that temple. Now, today, God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, as Paul preached on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17 and verse 24, but rather the church is His temple. And priests don't go to a uh, literal temple to sacrifice and worship for us in the temple as they once did under the law, but rather every Christian is made a priest unto God and is therefore expected to serve Him within the church. You see, worship is not a spectator event. The Christian life is not a spectator event. It's not something that's done vicariously by one on behalf of another. But rather, each Christian worships God in the temple, and Jesus required that all such worship be offered to God in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, God is a spirit, Jesus said, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. And never in the history of man Never, whether you're talking about the age of the Jewish temple, whether you're talking about the patriarchal dispensation or today in the Christian age, never in the history of man has God left it up to man to worship his own way or as he saw fit. God has always directed man in the kind of worship he desires and will accept. There is there's no exception to that. And, and for those back in that dispensation of time under the old law, the priests who profaned the worship of God, who came into the temple and profaned the worship of God and offered unto, that, uh, unto God that which He did not uh, require, that which He did not command, well, there, there were serious consequences to that. Just read the case of Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus, the 10th chapter. You see, the church is the temple today. and We come together in the church, each of us as priests unto God, to offer up praise and worship unto God. 
And that has to be according to a pattern. It must be in spirit and in truth. And a strong church is just as faithful to God in worship as the priests of the Old Testament were expected to be in that temple of old. Can you read how your church worships in the New Testament? Is everything that is done from the singing to the teaching to the Lord's Supper, is it exactly as Christ gave it and as the apostles revealed it in the New Testament? A strong church worships like a temple. Number four, a strong, a strong church submits like a kingdom. You know, the church is referred to as the kingdom of God in Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. And just as Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 teaches that the Lord adds to the church daily such as should be saved, well, so in parallel, Paul said in Colossians 1 and verse 13 that when we are delivered from the power of darkness, the same as being forgiven of our sins, delivered from sin, he said we are translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. So to be in the church is to be in the Lord's kingdom. The church constitutes the kingdom of Christ on earth. Well, what does a kingdom suggest? It suggests a king to which its subjects bow and submit allegiance and obedience. Now we might have lost sight today of what a kingdom really is, what it was in the uh, times in which the Bible was written and Jesus established His kingdom because we live in America in particular in a democratic form of government. We live in a republic where we elect, uh, where people, the citizens of a country elect uh, people to go to Washington and state houses and make laws and so forth. Uh, but a traditional kingdom is not that way and neither is the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus is the absolute monarch in His kingdom. And the church is to obey Him in all things. Colossians 1 and verse 18 says that Christ is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. Now, unfortunately, many so-called churches are more like the kingdom of uh, England, you might say, where the king or queen is more of a symbolic office or a figurehead. But decisions are made and policy is set by parliament carried out by the prime minister. Consequently, many churches don't look to King Jesus for authority in their worship and work, but rather to their councils, their conventions, and other creed-making bodies. Paul said, whatsoever we do in word or deed is to be done in the name of or by the authority of the Lord Jesus, Colossians 3 and verse 17. He decides how the worship is conducted. He decides when and how we commune. King Jesus assigns the work of the church. He sets the boundaries of fellowship. He directs the affairs of the kingdom. And a strong church recognizes that and submits to King Jesus alone. And lastly, a strong church is pure like a bride. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He not only likens the church here to a bride, but a pure, untouched bride, one adorned in the snow-white garments of purity and fidelity. And just as we're cleansed from unrighteousness by the blood of Jesus when we're washed in baptism, Acts 22 and 16, we are to remain pure and holy as the bride of Christ. Paul uses that metaphor again in Ephesians 5 verses 25 through 27 when he teaches that we've not only been sanctified and cleansed by the washing of water by the Word, but that we're to be presented without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing and holy and without blemish. You see, according to Paul's measure of a strong church, a church keeps itself pure in doctrine and practice and in daily living. A strong church emphasizes the need for faithfulness, holiness, godliness, righteousness, and shuns the works of the flesh. Strong churches are pure like a bride.
The Apostle Paul saw the gospel as a sacred trust, saying in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 5 that he didn't use flattering words nor a cloak of covetousness. But yet preachers week after week come into our living rooms with their handout. We don't expect you to fund our ministry or to pay to hear the gospel. Therefore, let the Bible speak is different. This program is brought to you by a local congregation of the Church of Christ in your community who simply want to reach out and spread the truth of New Testament Christianity. We thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak, and we hope that you'll tell someone else about this program and encourage them to see the difference. Follow Let the Bible Speak on Twitter at LTBS TV. Well, does the church that you worship with measure up? Uh, are you part of a strong church, a biblical church, a godly and healthy and vital church? Well, if not, we want to help you open the scriptures and uh, help you come to understand what the Bible describes as a strong church because that's what you need to be a part of. Today, if you would like a uh, copy of our lesson, Paul's Measure of a Strong Church, we'll be happy to send it to you. It's free of cost. Just simply let us know that you'd like a free transcript and we'll get that on its way. Also, don't forget to enroll in the free Bible study course and you can find other information and resources at our website, letthebiblespeak.tv and don't forget to connect with us on social media and subscribe to our podcast. Just search iTunes or Google Play for Let the Bible Speak TV. Thank you so much for spending your time with me today in study of the Word of God. I hope you'll make plans to meet me right back here next time for another study, the Lord willing. Until then, have a wonderful week. May the Lord bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by your friends in the Churches of Christ.